And they are that big, of course, because, as the great big bad wolf said, they need them for hearing, all the better to hear you with. They live in thick bush, and so those big ears are like specialized natural radar dishes that pick up sound from all angles. Hmm. Uh, we've had enough of that, have we? Yeah. I'm afraid we haven't actually found any lion tracks at all. And so I don't know where these things have gone. But I don't think anyone drove this road today, so that's why it's a good idea just to check. Ooh. Something jumped onto my hat. And this is, I have seen the Nguhuma Pride on this road quite often, and often actually eating something. Maybe? The vultures that we saw around there today have disappeared, so whatever it is that they were sitting there for, has either been devoured or they were just sitting there because it was a good place to rest. So I doubt the Inkahumas are sitting there on a great big buffalo or anything like that. Okay. No, nothing around here. My next port of call will be to head to the Cheetah Cut Line where I know there is a mistletoe plant and I wanted to show you about the fruit there and how it, is, it, it grows and the specialized bird that eats it. And I was reading about fruit-eating birds today. Before we carry on, let's just look at this little flock of magpie shrikes. Look at them all. And you can see exactly which ones are adults and which ones are not. The one in the middle there is an adult with his long tail, the one who just had his morning um, well, constitutional. And the others, you can see their tails are much shorter, will be this year's hatchlings, or fledglings. And they're just sitting there kind of chilling out, enjoying the view, I think. <laughs> preening away. And that preening, of course, is massively important. Whenever you see a bird running its beak over its feathers, it's not doing it just for the sake of having a, a, a scratch. It's normally doing it in order to realign the feathers, the barbs, and the barbicels, and the barbules, which are the different parts of the feathers, and realign them. And you can just hear in the background there, the bird that Scott just saw, the pearl-spotted owlet. I'll just see if I can make him call again. I've managed to get to respond to me here. I'm going to call him once more and see if he will come towards us. Let me wet my lips a bit more. Anyway, I'm so glad he responded to me. Makes me feel very good. Knight likes to, um, scratches the ego a little bit, you know. Beautiful bird, you've now seen him, and you've heard him. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Ah, 
Now, Bernie, you want to know about Pell's fishing owls and why don't we get them in this reserve? Um, kudu. Oh, yes, look at that. This is amazing. Look at this tiny little kudu. It's a little one that's been left by its parents. I'm sure its parents have gone off to have a drink. Its parents, its mother, would have gone off to have a drink. And a lot of these large antelope, the waterbuck do this, the kudu, they will leave their youngsters to go off and have a drink because they know that predators will concentrate around water holes. So they leave them lying under a tree like this. And if a predator were to come past here, the kudu would just hide, flatten its ears down against the ground and lie dead still, just like it's doing now. Isn't that cool? That's really amazing. It looks like it's just having a chilled out time, but it's actually frozen there, if not in terror, certainly in just about terror. He actually just looks like he's having an afternoon snooze, doesn't he? But he isn't. Very cool. There have been quite a few little kudu calves around at the moment and some waterbuck calves. And they do tend to give birth later than the impala do. But they've been born into a pretty tough time. Not moving. Anyway, Bernie, you were asking about Pell's fishing owls. Pell's fishing owls, for those of you who don't know, very large brown bird. And the beautiful... Beaut sorry, excuse me. Um, beautiful pearls fishing owl is found in the Sabi sand sometimes, especially along the rivers, um, but not often. They like permanent water with still pools where they can hunt from a perch at night. But you do find them in the Sabi sands from time to time. I don't think you'll ever find them around here because we don't have rivers with large trees overhanging them. I think the call was to link to Scott, is that correct, Nicola, with a bee eater? Go to Scott. See you now. Finally, a decent view of a European bee eater. They have got the most awesome coloration. You'll notice probably at the moment the brightest color you can see is that yellow under its beak. If it turns and faces us, it's got a beautiful bluish tinge, like a bluey greeny tinge on their underbelly. And we've been hearing these birds. It's the one that's calling now. So often, and we've shown you them flying, again, so often, but seldom have we got you a good view of them perched like this. Um, I'm hoping if and when it does take off, what, let's, let's take a gamble here. Let's drive up to it slowly. That way we're going to be able to get you a closer, tighter frame. And hopefully Mickey will be able to slow motion when it takes off. So you can see its bright blue coloration. Brian. Ideally it would have flown towards us, not away from us, but at least we got it in the bag. And we might have another crack at it. I've seen where it's landed. Which is which is <laughs> harder than you think actually because I'm watching the monitor down here as it flies away. So then uh, it, it's, it, it made no sense me saying that, but it does make sense. Just make you guys realize I haven't lost my marbles completely. It can be quite tricky, looking down like this, watching what the leopard does, watching what the bird does, thinking about what to say, and then you look up and you're like, where am I? Where'd the leopard go? You don't even know if it's on the left or the right of the vehicle anymore, when you get engrossed enough in the sighting. It is one of the hardest things to get used to, the monitor. Because naturally, when you guide with guests, you look out with your guests into the bush, not into the monitor. <laughs> Hello, Whitney. You would like to know with all the turning around and looking back at camera, how many non-bendy trees have I driven into? One, that was an epic crash. I drove straight into a ginormous marula tree. Big, big tree. Solid, huge. 
I looked up and it was too late. I don't even know if I looked up. We just donk into the tree. Again, we were trying to get you a view of, I think, a lilac-crested roller. Um, so I've had one good crash that some of you will remember. It was hilarious. Um, I don't know, Matt. The video will be somewhere. It's just, I don't know who's going to be able to find it timelessly. Although some of our viewers have got a very good archiving system, so somebody may be able to find out exactly where that crash is. It's hilarious with me. But yeah, thankfully only one crash in my time here so far. So we are about to drive up onto the Arethusa Dam Wall. The camp you'll notice is spread out on the opposite side there. And you'll see these little birds feeding below us, chasing one another around our quite interesting characters called the helmeted guinea fowl. Look at their bright blue heads, spotted feathers, awesome, awesome creatures. Oh, that one's enjoying some grass seeds there on the run. Speaking of running, they can run incredibly quickly. They often decide to run when being attacked by predators, aerial predators, even birds of prey as opposed to fly, because they're not the fastest of flyers. Very good. Also, very good with regards to alarm calls. That's not them calling, that's a Franklin calling nearby, one of their relatives. When they do let off their alarm call, it can be heard from far away and it can be a very good indicator that danger is near. Tony in London, you'd like to know if we get an algae that you get over in the UK, which apparently kills frogs, called blue-green algae. Not that I've seen. Um, that's certainly not to say that it doesn't occur in Africa, but I have never come across it. Sounds nasty though, Tony. Thanks for letting us know about that. Sunita in India and I think Sunita might be planning her attack on how exactly or what exactly she needs to do in order to become a guide and Sunita it's not difficult at all you basically need uh, no qualifications in order to to start a training course um, you can I've got a degree in anything. I got a degree in property development before coming and doing my six-month training course in the bush. Um, so, like, yeah, I mean, that's all it really takes is a six-month course to get your national requirements regarding the tests you need to do. There's a organization called FGASA, F-G-A-S-A, Field Guides Association of South Africa, and they are the kind of medium that you go through in order to become legal to guide in South Africa or at least it was it may have changed ever so slightly but it's not difficult usually a six-month course uh, gets you into the driver's seat at the lodge and thereafter you know it takes time depending on the individual to gain experience and then grow up and work at fancier lodges where you may be uh, allowed to drive around more pristine wilderness areas or have higher paying guests generally that will help you earn more money. It's a gratuity based job. Your salary covers your bar tab as a guide and you rely very heavily on gratuities. Um, so 
obviously the, the more experienced you become, the, the more ex the more fancy the lodge you can work at, and that way you'll be in a better position to earn better money. We've got a, a runner. I think we'll be able to catch up to it before it disappears, though. It is a gigantic, gigantic leopard tortoise. It's temporarily stopped, sizing us up. Have you been running away with some food in your mouth? It looks like it. It looks like it's got some leaves dangling out the side of its beak-like mouth. I've got a moose um, And off it goes. Shame, it can't be an easy time of year for the tortoises. Imagine not being able to move huge distances in a time like this where food is so scarce and more importantly, water. That's why often when we do have, when we have had recent rains, it's the tortoises you see flocking to the little puddles in the road to quench their thirst. Hello, Judy, who is a teacher, who is getting very excited for her class to also join us on these live safaris. We're going to be doing, or focusing on, answering a lot of their questions in, I think, tomorrow and the next day. And Judy, we are also very, very excited for that. And hopefully more and more schools and classrooms around the world will also join in on this wonderful experience. I could think of nothing better than my teacher telling me, OK, it's safari live time now. Um, obviously, I'm a little bit biased because I'm involved in this wonderful product, but also because I do love this safari experience in general and anyway to be on safari whether it's safari live or your own safaris wherever you may be going around the world it's always a wonderful journey and that's what the word safari means the kiswahili word meaning journey obviously in our case it's a journey through the african wilderness in Jacksonville you would like to know what the local tribe people is uh, is called in South Africa and you've said it's in Kenya it's the Maasai people um, there's many tribes in South Africa as well as Kenya so Maasai are one of the tribes that live in Kenya but not the only one there are many different uh, tribes of which I'm battling to come up uh, with the names of the different tribes and groups. Oh! But you get the Takana tribes in the far north of uh, Kenya, you get the Samburu tribesmen in the central parts of Kenya, and the Maasai are further to the south, stretching into Tanzania. There are other smaller variations and kind of groups within those large uh, tribes you could say in South Africa we've got nine different African languages and basically a tribe to go with each one in this part of South Africa it's the Shangan people and the Shangan people stretch into Mozambique you also get the Zulu people from the south of us the squirrel that's just a long pool it could be at anything but it could be at something important like a leopard so yeah, the Shangan people are the area in this people, and the Zulu people are further south, the Torza people are down to the Cape, so many different tribes within South Africa. 
There's some exciting news and you're going to have to head across to James's vehicle to find out exactly what it is. Well, the exciting news, everybody, is that we can see a enormous grey cloud coming in from the west. It's really exciting, isn't it, VM? Yes. Well, how do you feel? Excited? Uh, a little bit. A little bit excited. Oh, good. Viam, look at that on the road. What do you see? Um... Aha! Uh -huh. Lions! <coughs> now, everybody, what I think this is, I, if I'm not mistaken, and I have, we haven't been any closer than you are right now, I think this is the missing Nkuhuma lioness and one of the Birminghams. I might be entirely wrong, but I think that's what's going on here. Now, Nicola has already managed to identify that this is not the lioness or a lioness that is missing. Have a look, see here what's going on. Nicola, tell us how you identify this lioness immediately. I see. It is Nicola's it is Nicola's opinion that this lioness has got slightly odd shaped eyes. Slightly slanted eyes. I can I see exactly what she means, actually. I haven't noticed it before, but yeah, I would agree with that completely. Now, this male looks like he's been mauled by his brothers. Look at his face. He's absolutely been smashed. I wonder, I'm pretty sure they must be mating. And I wonder if she hasn't had a go at him as well. Now, I haven't seen the Birminghams for so long. I don't know which one this is. But that is a big, nasty fight they've been having. She's calling. Listen. You hear that? It's a gentle contact cord. Gentle contact call, hoping the others will come out. She's just going... Oh, it's that quiet. Oh. Now, VMP, I know you'll desperately want to do a virtual reality shoot. What I'm going to do is move in just in here, and then if the others do come out of the bush, you'll be able to push record. Okay. Sounds good. real spot of luck everyone this is the one road of course we didn't come down earlier today mm. and <laughs> Kat and Raisa you're extremely excited by the fact that we're looking at a male lion finally I am totally with you on that, I agree. It is wonderful. But look how damaged he is. He's got cuts and bruises all over him. I don't think, I mean, some of that might be from her. You know, during the mating, it can become quite aggressive. It's not quite as aggressive as it is with leopards, though. That, no, that shoulder, that shoulder, and he's a huge wound on his belly. Look at that. That looks like it could have been inflicted by a buffalo. It looks like a big puncture wound. Now, so any of you out there who recognize this male lion, I'd love to know which Birmingham you think it is. The MP, let me go a little bit further forward for you, and you can... Get a slightly, you won't have to avoid my head, my big fat bonce. There we go. That's better. That's fantastic. Isn't that great? 
So this lioness is not very old. You can see she's still got a very pink nose. And that means she's well under six years old. The slant-eyed pink nose, we can call her for now. And this male is the very scarry Birmingham. And I know, like I say, a lot of you keep up with updates from Ancora where these guys have been seen a lot of late. In various other parts of the Sabi Sands. And if you have some picture identicates of them, it would be fascinating to know. Please post them, hashtag Safari Live or questions at wildearth.tv and tell us which of the Birmingham boys do you think this is. I'm just going to quickly call them in on the radio. I know Steph did, but let me just quickly do it. The station's one male, one female line, static on cheetah cut line, about 300 metres to the south of the junction with the Bufflesaw cut line. She's in absolutely fine condition. Go. Sorry, James. One male, one female line, cheetah cut line, 300 meters south of the junction with Biffles Hook cut line. They are static on the road. Sorry, excuse me, everyone. It looks like he's a female from the Nkuhumas, and I don't know who the male is. Must be a Birmingham, I think. Yeah, I guess I'm here in between the second rocket and another Birmingham here. Now, this is Johan speaking. Um, but I would like to respond. And he's calling us from not far from here, and he says there is another Birmingham male to the right-hand side of your picture, basically. Put him there. Completely relaxed. Yeah, no, he's in the, he's been in the wars, this fellow. And this is the lot of the male line. Of course, he's designed to fight. So I, I mean, I'm pretty sure, given the fact that they weren't here this morning. And we did drive up and down here quite a lot. Copying your seat? No, sorry. I, I unplugged myself by mistake. Go ahead, Nikki. Sorry about that. And Paul Rizzo, you want to know if this, if this male could possibly be the one with the scar across his face that Brent saw? Yes, could well be. I mean, he's definitely got a nasty, nasty set of scars all the way down the left-hand side of his face. I mean, a lot of them look quite recent, though. I wonder if he hasn't been in a fairly serious scrap fairly recently. Go ahead. wonderful to find them. Like I say, didn't find them this morning and we were here relatively late and I suspect quite strongly therefore that they are mating and they will move around a little bit if they're mating and they would have been, you know what, they would have been in these bushes not far from here at all. Hmm. Do you say lions and a cloud with possible rain coming in? What could be more exciting? Well, I agree completely. What could possibly be more exciting? While they're sleeping, let's head across to Scott. He's got something very nice to show you, and we'll wait here and see if they do anything. We just thought we'd bring you across to have a look at this giraffe silhouette here at the Arethusa airstrip, a large open expanse, which is quite rare in the Sabi Sands. There we go, there's the windsock that you can see. Well done to James, who has got you into a wonderful spot with those lion, and what a surprise that is. So, very happy for all of you. 
and let's hope that some action unfolds there. Maybe they will be making love. And I'm certainly very jealous of the situation you're in. We're going to send you back there and continue on our way. Our plan is to try and find a leopard so that we can try and get some action of this in this end of the safari as well. Otherwise, we're going to battle to compete with those lions that James has found. Cool. Good luck. Goodbye. Right, everybody. Uh, you, go, you go to the lions. Don't worry about me here. We just want to do a virtual reality shoot here with this thing on the front of the car, but this <laughs> little beeping device, which is a, supposed to be a very fancy sinking device, is supposed to be making a beeping sound, but it is not. Yeah? Shall I throw it out of the car? No, it's probably cable. Cable related. Yeah. You get out. <laughs> Ooh, this is a very clever question. Kaluti from New Franklin. I don't know where New Franklin is. Sounds like an interesting spot to be. You say, could her call be infrasonic? In other words, below the sound waves that we are able to hear. So lower down a wider um, wavelength, a lower frequency. Kaluti, yes, there is an element of infrasound in the lion's call, definitely. No question. And it travels along the ground. That's why she pushes her head towards the ground and calls like that. And for us, it'll sound a lot more quiet than it will to a lion listening out for it. So, yes, I think that's a really good um, supposition, if you like, that the call there is quite infrasonic. Very nice. And Debbie, yes, of course, you've noticed that his mane is quite dark. And it's, in fact, in, I mean, if you look at him from the front, it's a, almost a black mane. And you say, does that mean that there's a lot of, of testosterone in his body? Yes, it does. It's precisely what it means. There will be lots of testosterone. The more black a lion's mane is, the more testosterone there is in his body. And, of course, the older they get, they do often get a bit darker as they get older. But the amount of testosterone is what the color is. It's gray, their skin. Here we go. And look at him. Even though he's got those injuries, he's completely walking without any form of limp. She had a limp the last time we saw her, and she's absolutely fine now. This is magnificent. I'm just going to quickly tell the VR what's going on. Lions in front on the road, grey skies above, perhaps some rain. Look at those eyes and the scars on that lion. Let's just see what he does. We originally thought they might be mating. She might be going off to look, in fact, for the rest of her pride. He looks like he's had enough of this. He's very tired. He's lean. Look at look at his build. He's not. You know, he does, he's not nearly as heavy as those, as those Matimbas, and I think he's probably two years off being as heavy as he's going to be. Mm. Let's get around the side of him. So there he is to the left, and way up in front there, the female, she's not interested in him. Zoe, we're very close to him now. We're only about three and a half feet from him. He wants to know if he can get those scars from a kill, from being at a kill. Definitely he can, Zoe. Uh, it wouldn't only be in a fight with other males, but certainly over a kill, they will hit each other. But you see, I think this, this to me looks much more severe than that. This looks like he's had a proper conflict. But certainly they can absolutely get sort of bloody marks on their faces from the fights that they have. Isn't he lovely? He's a magnificent fellow. And Sunel, you're in Trinidad, and you said how far away are these lines? Well, this line is about only five feet. Yeah, not a bit more than four feet, maybe five feet from us. He's very relaxed. 
and he's watching his consort move. Here she goes. I wonder if they have been mating. I don't know. She's definitely looking for definitely looking for the rest of the pride. She stopped to urinate there. Now that will be an indication to him. We'll see when he gets there if he ex exhibits that sort of flemming behavior, if he smells the urine and tries to tell whether she's an estrus or not. But I suspect there's an element of that because I don't know why otherwise he'd be following her. Males and females don't necessarily like to be with each other all the time. And that is because males, of course, will steal all of the food from the females. And so they only kind of really want to be around the males when they are mating. And you can see his ears are pinned back. He's listening to us as we move behind him. So I'm just going to keep my distance. I don't want to disturb him or make him go any faster. But they are looking like they're going to cross north into Biffle's Hook. So I'm just going to quickly give an update there on the radio. Stations, these two animals are now mobile due north up Cheetah Cat Line. The female has crossed north into Biffle's Hook. The male is just behind her. sad unfortunately I think this is going to be the last we are going to see of them <laughs> thank you Martin you say all is forgiven for my complete incompetence at finding anything large and magnificent today simply because we have a Birmingham boy with us I agree I forgive myself even oh that's a nice smell isn't it VM oh grief now notice he didn't stop to smell. He's just following her. Now he's going to mark his territory. There he is marking against the tree. She is off in front there, down that road. And I think he's going to follow her straight into Biffle's Hook. Maybe he won't. There is another male, and another two males behind us on Torchwood. But he's going to follow his consort, I think. Oh, no, he seems to be in two minds. Don't go that way, fellow. Come this way. When in doubt, have a sleep. <laughs> it's so wonderful. Now, oh, there he goes, he's watching something. Dominique, you're in Paris. You might be a new viewer, and if you are, thank you very much for getting hold of us, and thank you for watching. Um, there she is, you can just see her over the top there. Now, Dominique, you want to know if these lions are comfortable with us, with them lying on the road, and what, how would they react if they became uncomfortable? They are completely confident and comfortable. Sorry, just stand by, Steph. They are completely comfortable and completely confident, and what happens is that if they are uncomfortable, like he was slightly there when we were driving up behind him and he flattened his ears back, they do give it a behavioral indication. They'll flatten their ears, they might growl, but normally they will just walk away. That's not why he's moving now. That's not why she was moving. She's looking for the rest of her pride. And he's just following on because he thinks she might be an estrus. That's going to be the last of it, I'm afraid. So now we'll see if we can find some tracks. But the very fact... Can I just give it that? Hmm? No. Sorry. I'm just uh, taking instructions from my friend VM. We'll just try and find a fresh track for you that is obvious in this light. Is there one that side? Okay, let's just turn around. While we do that, let me quickly get hold of Steph. He was trying to get hold of me. He found these lines. Steph, go ahead. Uh -huh. 
I can't see the animal there. Let's quickly go across to Scott. There is some good news here. I'll keep you posted. Well, very happy that you had some wonderful views of those two lines. Interesting that the one is so battered. This is a very rare bird, everyone, called a southern ground hornbill. And we just saw it fly up into this big dead tree. I'm guessing it may be planning on spending the night here. And before it goes to bed, it looks like it's going to be doing some cleaning after a day out in the field. They'll kind of act like turkeys. They walk along the ground looking for food. They eat all manner of prey, insects, reptiles, snakes, lizards, frogs baby birds, eggs, you name it, they'll eat it. Interesting that this one is alone. They usually fly in f small family flocks. Um, I'm just going to ask Brian quickly to speak to it in Hornbill. Um, here goes. This is the noise they make. Well done, Brian. Brian is very talented when it comes to making various noises and that was a very good rendition of the ground hornbill. I'm hoping this one is going to respond to Brian but it doesn't look like it's interested to chat to us. Let's have one more try. Let's have one more try. Ask it something different, Brian. Okay. Say something I think my else. dialect is wrong though. I think... Your wrong accent. Yeah, wrong at right, accent. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> Got its head turned there. Imagine it just burst out into song now. Oh, come on! <gasps> I thought it was going to think about doing it there. Maybe it's just preparing itself. Come on! Come on! It looks like it wants to do something. Is it building up? Is it building up for a vocalization? Almost like it's filling up its bagpipes. Come on, come on. What are you doing? You're looking, you're looking like you're wanting to do something. Scotty. Or are you just posturing? Hello, Doug. Uh, just a uh, ground hornbill up in the tree, yeah? Hey, Superman. Thanks. I'll leave you to it. Copy. See you later. So Doug just arrived behind us and was wondering what we were watching. But he obviously feels his guests will not appreciate this bird. Are you going to regurgitate something? He's calling. It's calling. Keep quiet, everyone. Listen carefully. And it's just like, I guess. believe it. Brian, the hornbill whisperer, has finally coaxed this bird into calling for us. It's calling very softly. It may increase volume. you guys managed to speak to a pearl spotted owlet earlier with James. We are becoming one with the animals of Juma. I've never ever seen this before. I've heard them calling a huge amount of times but I've never seen it. This is fascinating. Seems like it's building up momentum. Getting a bit louder. And Raisa, you are right. Wow, Brian, you are awesome. 
when we first came across this horn bull, we knew that you guys were with those lions and thought, there's no ways we're gonna get this guy on screen. But I guess that is the beauty of being on safari. You just never know what's gonna happen. It flew up off the road, landed perfectly in this tree. And I think is now asking Brian out on a date. It would be an interesting date though because it looks like to me that it is a male. You cannot see any small blue patches on that red throat patch, a gula patch, which is really inflated so you can see very clearly now. A female will have a blue patch within the middle of that red gula patch, which I'll show you in the book afterwards. So I think this is a lonely male, hoping to find some ladies and maybe start a flock of his own. What's interesting with this is that you can also tell that it's the male simply from the call. The female's got a different call and it's a response to the male's call. He's currently saying, Honey, come home. Honey, come home. Honey, come home. And then the female would respond, No, not yet. Do, do, do. So merely from the call, you can hear that it's the male. You know, usually together like they are in their family flocks, you'll hear the female immediately respond and he's desperately begging honey come home willow wanderer who's watching in the uk this is your favorite south african bird and you've been lucky enough to see them several times in the kruger park but i bet you you've never seen them doing this willow wanderer this is absolutely awesome. And there's some beautiful orange glows coming from the west, just below the bird. A picturesque scene. Stop to go and doing some preening there. Thought, hang on, maybe my feathers are out of line, and that's why the lady's not coming home. Although it looks like the bagpipes are filling up again. Beautiful. Gen B, interesting that you've noticed that you think that this hornbill's looking a little bit thin, and. I'm just going to try and move the vehicle a little bit. We've got this road blocked and there's somebody trying to get past. Good, just try and get out of the way. Oh, well that's perfect. We'll be able to try and get into another spot once this other vehicle has passed by. Jen B, you've noticed that the hornbill is looking a little bit thin. And I think that's merely due to the fact that it's uh, in an awkward position that you've never seen one in before. They're usually walking along the ground. Are you? Um, they're usually in an awkward position. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, they're usually walking along the ground where they'll be able to kind of hold their body a little bit differently to when they are perched on a branch like that. So I think it's merely the fact that it's perched in an interesting spot. Oh, Brown, quickly, it's coming, flying over. Look at this. Awesome. What a way to finish off the sighting. Well done, Brian, there. Um, Sort up at a tree, beautiful sunset, calling and then flying off. It doesn't get much better than that. You may have even faintly be able to hear its wings as it flew past. Wunderbar. Well done, Brian. Thank you. You have a hidden talent that I don't think you even knew you had. Um, 
good. We're going to send you back to James and continue on with our adventure. See you shortly. Now, believe it or not, everyone, <laughs> well, there are two amazing things here. First is that Steph managed to spot what Viam is pointing the camera at there, and deep inside that thicket is a kill. It must have been made by a leopard because it's hoisted into that tree. I'm going to try and get a better view of it, but he did not see the leopard. Well, that either means that the leopard is off having a drink, or perhaps it's that one that Viam spotted the other day with Scott, who we now know as Gijima, the runner. So what I'm going to do is just ease slowly backwards. It's just inside Biffle's hook, so we can't sort of get right underneath it. But if it is Gijima's kill, he will most likely be lying kind of... He'll be watching us, basically. And we need to try and spot him. Now, we can smell the kill. I wonder if that's not how Steph managed to find it. But it's, it's almost impossible to see. I can just see a glimpse of it through there. There's the leopard. The leopard is in the tree. Or something else is flat. No, it must be. It is. It's in the tree. <laughs> but you can't, you're not going to be able to see it. Hang on a second, let me get back with it. This is, this is appalling. The reason I say it's in the tree is that the limb, one of the limbs of the kill started moving. And unless the disemboweled antelope is still alive, it's being eaten. This is terrible. Oh, we can't go in there. This is just suspense of the worst kind. <laughs> I'm going to call Johan and tell him to come here. He can come here, of course. They might get a better view. I mean, even if we could get in there, people, there is a, I mean, the amount of bush in the way. Bimby, you haven't seen anything, huh? Sort of kill a little bit. Did you see it moving? This truly is, is I'm afraid, uh, it's almost a complete waste of time. This is as close as we can possibly get. Just try and zoom in there. That's the kill there, right? No, that's a piece of tree. Yeah. It was up there somewhere. Go for it. I saw a spot earlier there. You did see a spot? Yeah. <laughs> this is the brilliance of the leopard, of course. Say when, Diambi. Oh, yeah. This is a vicious thicket of black monkey thorn trees. <laughs> it's a very nice view. And fall again? Uh, yeah. Do you think we are barking up the wrong tree, as it were? <laughs> What about there? No? There's the kill. There you can see it. There. No. Uh, there. There you can see the kill. There's the kill. That is the kill. Of now you can believe me, everybody. There is a thing, an impala lying in the tree. Did not climb up there of its own volition. 
and therefore we can quite safely say killed by a leopard and hauled up there. Now, as I say, I did see some movement. I'm just going to quickly update it, and just VMP, if you wouldn't mind, just keep looking in the tree there. <laughs> Johan, do you cover Johan? Johan, there is a, I think it looks like an impala in this weeping wattle tree. Best approach is to come along the Bivles or cut line. Uh, is it big thicket? And so we can't actually, well, we can't go in there anyway, but no visual of the cat at this stage. And you say you've just clocked in and what's in there? Well, uh, well, you may ask. And there's an impala sitting in the tree there. We were lying, draped in the tree, and it was definitely placed there by the spotted cat. Which spotted cat, we don't know, but I saw some brief movement just in the tree, and I was hoping that we might get a view of the leopard. It was found, this kill was found by Steph. We're just gonna do a turnaround and come past. Now, Ruth, on Twitter, you want to know how it is that I can possibly assert beyond the shadow of a doubt that a impala could not have climbed that tree of his own volition. Um, Ruth, I know some things are unlikely, some things are probable, and some things just, you know, seem to be completely impossible. Uh, the thought of an impala with its hooves being able to haul itself up into a tree and then drape itself like that, um, I think are unlikely. Likewise, I'm not sure it would have disemboweled itself at the same time. Now we're losing light here, of course. No, Deborah, you, we're not near the lions. You say, is the leopard hiding from the lions? No, we know we're near the lions. We're quite a long way from them. Now, we're going to do one very last pass by here and just see if we can't get a brief glimpse of a spot. I mean, even if we do see the leopard in there, we'd actually be able to view it. Like a in this light. <laughs> as Viam says, I don't know if you heard him, he says, everything looks like a leopard in this light. I agree. It's exactly why a leopard is the color that it is. We're going to leave it, everybody, I'm afraid. That's it. All right. We'll keep looking around here. While we do that, let's head across to Scott on Arethusa. Well, torture across there on James's vehicle, but still exciting stuff, and we thought we would give you some open, clear beauty after having your head in the bushes trying to work out what was going on with that leopard kill. Now, this may come as a bit of a surprise to a lot of you, but the sunset that we are busy enjoying will only happen again with myself here and Nikki here another four more times. You heard correctly, Nikki and I are going to be leaving Safari Live on Saturday, it will be our last day. It's obviously sad news, we love this uh, experience, this product, the team, the people, everyone here, uh, including you guys, have made our lives an absolute joy for me over a year, for Nikki, uh, just approaching a year soon. And it was not an easy decision to make, but we have decided to move on. And we're not too sure where we're going to be going just yet, but we've got a few weddings around the corner uh, that we need to be at. And we're possibly going to be doing some traveling. Well, that is the main reason we're actually moving on, is just to go and explore more parts of Africa and see what else is going on on the many wonderful countries that surround us here. I've only explored a little bit of Africa so far, and my passion is seeing and discovering and exploring new places uh, and new activities, just like uh, the experience that I got to explore and experience with you guys here. It's been an incredible, incredible 
operation to be involved in. As you guys all know, um, maybe less so than your viewers, but I mean, it's incredible the bonds that we've all built up with one another, the moments and experiences we've all shared together, uh, considering the distances between us is, is remarkable and there's no other experience like this in the world so to leave something like this knowing that uh, you can't go and get a job elsewhere any, anywhere like this is obviously uh, you know a big decision for us but you never know what the future may hold once uh, Nikki and I have got our traveling done uh, there, anything could be possible and it's certainly not goodbye forever um, we are gonna be joining you guys the viewers uh, and sending through questions to keep track of everyone um, watching the new presenters grow is going to be something that's going to be great for for us to experience uh, vicariously being a viewer and also for you guys so that's also kind of something that i'm quite happy about and it's made me happy by by us leaving we are opening up the doors for for, for two other people to come here and and get to have the fun and joy and love this uh, experience as much as we have and i think there's nothing wrong with sharing that so cold play uh, i'm happy to hear that i am your favorite obviously every, all of you have your favorites and i'm obviously cold plays that's very touching so thank you for those of you who don't know cold play is a massive very popular band so it's quite quite touching that they <laughs> <laughs> that they, they think i'm i'm the best um, only kidding cold play but thank you very much for your kind words um like I say, there's not too much really to discuss. There's no hidden agendas here. Um, it's merely time for us to move on. Of course, we're going to not be able to take you along with us on live experiences, but we certainly will keep you updated uh, on our travels, on our safaris, wherever they may be. It could be in Botswana, Zambia, Kenya. Who knows? Uh, the options are endless, and I'm really excited for the, the changes of scenery that we are going to be able to experience, and we'll definitely share those experiences with you. Again, though, not live, which is key, um, but I'll try and update my Facebook page and Instagram as often as I can. So we'll definitely be keeping Keeping you updated, but for now we don't know actually where we are going. So that in itself is 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 exciting prospects. And Nikki's shouting Kenya in my ear through the earpiece. She wants to head up there and possibly get involved in some horse riding safaris. That'll be something fun. Uh, she loves horse riding and I love safaris. So if we can do both together, then we are winning. So that might be something that we'll be able to tell you about in the future. But I'd like to say thank you now. Um, it's not the end yet. Like I said, uh, our last drive will be on, on Saturday evening. So four more days, four more mornings, and four more sunsets uh, will be shared with you guys. And I'm really looking forward to it. I'm hoping the animals all come out of their hiding places. Um, but it seems like they have been with those lioness and the lion that James saw this evening. So things are picking up, and I hope they continue to until we head off. And after we head off, they must continue to pick up and... I want to just say thank you again for everyone uh, involved, including obviously the people who started Wild Earth, uh, the people who are w I've been working with, as well as you guys, the viewers, who make it all possible to do what we do. So thank you very much, and apologies if it has upset you, that news, but like I say, every scenario that you may experience in life will have pros and cons, and I guess we just need to focus on the positives. Like Sharon just said, you've got to kind of follow your heart. And while Nikki and I are both young and carefree with no responsibilities, uh, it's, it's a great opportunity for us to spread our wings and, and see where the road takes us. So that's that. And we... Something to look forward to, um, which has been mentioned in the blog that will be available for all of you guys to read uh, I think on our Facebook page that Louise kindly did regarding us going but exciting prospects is that uh, Nikki and I will be teamed up together for the final drive on Saturday afternoon Nikki will be on camera and I'll be driving as uh, some of you would have seen her behind camera before and she's good she may be a little bit shaky I warn you in advance because she hasn't done it as often as required to be super sharp but that's going to be something to look forward to and who knows maybe we'll swap around and get Nikki into the driver's seat and I'll be behind the camera so that you guys can ask her a few questions on that last drive so that's something to look forward to as well as the 
fact that we're going to be doing a fireside chat towards the end of that drive as well. So that's something to look forward to. Khada, you say you're going to be missing my number one go-to phrase when something exciting is happening, and that is, can you believe it? <laughs> and, um, <laughs> <laughs> There's a few more little catchphrases, I guess, but that is my go-to one that I've probably said many, many times. Yeah, what fun we've all had, hey? Really, to be able to share the, the, the experiences that we have with the amount of people that we all have is fascinating. We could all, one day, be sitting around a ginormous campfire, sharing moments and memories that we were all there witnessing as it happened and that is something that nothing else on earth can really compete with usually you'd have six guests that may remember a certain thing that unfolded but like i said in this case it can be hundreds if not thousands of people all in that moment together and those moments that we've shared have been absolutely awesome so thank you for jumping on our vehicles every day and making this the biggest safari operation on the planet. And Dream, you've said that we must head off and go and have fun with the hope of one day coming back. And that certainly is a hope. Um, the way the Safari Live experience is going, I can imagine only that it will grow into bigger and better things with possibly multiple operations on the go. And possibly then uh, they may need an extra hand and Nikki and I may have been traveled out by that stage. And certainly I could think of nothing better than coming back in the future. I certainly will be coming to visit the crew that we've become very close to. So even if it's just socially, I will definitely be coming back here. But certainly, um, if the opportunity arises, there's absolutely no reason why Nicky and I would not jump at it. But let's see what happens. It could be a long, dusty, windy road with many forks in it before the fork comes that could bring us back here. So we'll just have to wait and see. Susie, um, thanks for letting me know that your mother has a crush on me <laughs> and that she is going to miss me. I hope you miss me as well. And I hope that your mother isn't going to miss me too terribly that it causes you to have to console her. If that is the case, let me know if I can assist in shifts, consoling shifts, but I don't think that is going to be the case. I guess I should get the spotlights out and keep looking for animals. I'm not gone just yet. <laughs> Let's see what we can find. On my wish list before I go, an African rock python is very, very high up there. So that's one of my wish lists. I'll continue to let you know of any others that come to mind. I just dimmed the bright lights there to spare these impalas eyeballs. Blind them. You're wondering what that little move maneuver was all about. So to the many, many people who have all sent through very kind words and kind wishes for our future. A huge, huge thank you. Um, it would be possible to go through all of them and that's testament to how many people have sent those messages through. So huge, huge thank you. And apologies that we haven't been able to address everyone's messages, but I will be certain to go through them after the safari so that I know exactly what all of you have wished and said so thank you for that and i will go through that a little bit later another thing that i'm hoping for on the wish list is that the rumors of 
Karula is still possibly having a cub, it's true, and that we get to see her. Imagine we come around a corner and there she is, walking with one of her cubs in her mouth, down the road, the other little cub battling to keep up as it's its turn to walk. It could happen. And that is another thing that's secretly been playing in the back of my mind at the moment. Confirming whether in fact she does still have cubs would be a very special moment to share with all of you. of leopards. I wonder which leopard made that kill across in Buffalzook. I know James speculated that it could be Gajima, our new male leopard that we only got to see a brief glimpse of once. Possibly twice, I think. Brian remembers having a sighting with him with Brent, not Brian. Maybe it was Vian. Um, and one of the cameramen I've chatted to said they remember having a brief sighting of a skittish male with Brent once upon a time, a couple of months back. Anyway, it would be good if that is him. Pity the kill isn't closer towards us, but the moments when he does have kills are going to be great moments that we can try and start habituating him. And even though in, in, in this case we won't be there, another vehicle will be there from Buffalo. And the more vehicles that he gets exposed to, eventually he will hopefully realize that we are here in peace. Let's see if we can't get you a little silhouette here. There are some kudu playing King of the Castle. Look at those huge satellite dishes poking out. And I'm sure a lot of you would have been able to tell that they was good, these were kudu, even though it is just their silhouette. You can't see any coloration but those massive, massive ears that can pivot in any which way they desire, one forward, one back. And what a perfect spot for those kudu to watch the sunset and listen to the surroundings, making sure they're safe. You would have noticed tiny little horns protruding on the one of the right. Oh, how was that little ear dance? That was fascinating. Um, the young male, this is a female here. A few little bugs flying around. I think those could be driver ants that are flying a lot. So I had a question about driver ants just the other day. Or it could be reproductive termites ejecting themselves from the termite mound that the kudu are standing on. That's probably more likely there's quite a few little bugs flying off and the numbers of them indicate yeah they are reproductive termites one has just landed here that i'm going to try and show you okay i do have one in my paws and i'm just going to let it Ooh. okay we're gonna have to be quick brian's ready oh it's on the end of my oh no not the best <laughs> not the best but it's still in the car there, Brian. I think are we do are we, are we it's too close. There we go. Here it comes. It's about to pop out into view. Keep coming. Oh, here it is. I'm just gonna lean under and grab it. Oh, another one's coming. Oh, here we go. Brief glimpses, they're all being attracted to the light, so they're gonna flood the vehicle, but at least we know that that is the reproductive termites, the winged elates that are going to be starting new germ termitariums somewhere possibly nearby. There's also going to be a whole bunch of animals that are feeding on these little flying termites as they continue to emerge in their thousands. Wonderful! Thank you very much, everyone, for your extremely kind words. We are going to be sending you over to James now for an update on what he's getting up to. Okay, thanks. Right, everybody, here we are. Um, well, I mean, there's not a great deal to say other than sad news, indeed. We've known for a little while, of course. Uh, but now the reality's kind of hit home. And, well, nothing stays the same, of course especially out here in the bush. There's termites everywhere, look at them. James, They're coming out. Hmm? They don't bite. They're termites. <laughs> and Brian, yes, I hope Scott will tell us where all the nests are before he goes. Um, 
That, of course, is a very minor part of why it will be sad to see him go. And, of course, Nicola, let us not forget, whose dulcet tones have filled my ears since I arrived here in May last year. But anyway, as I say, the bush, I remember, you know, from working in these lodges, there's almost a constant turnover of staff as people come and go and they, you know, often people come to the bush to sort of find themselves. And sometimes they do and then they go off and sometimes they don't and they go off anyway. Um, I don't know, I don't think it's so much a case of Scott and Nikki finding themselves, but there is this constant state of flux and it can be very unsettling, I must say. Anyway, I think it's, it's a good thing for them for now and I hope very much that they will be back before not too long. There are millions of termites flying at my head. Ah. Right. And now you're obviously looking from Scott's vehicle and you can see these hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of termites flying all over the place attacking us. Viema, they're biting you. They just crawled under my shirt. They just crawled under Viam's shirt. I'm going to close my box here. I don't need them in my box. They're coming here. Look, they're coming out right next to us. So when you come back to us, we'll show you where they're coming from. There they are. They're coming out of this mound here. Oh my goodness. There are... <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is truly incredible. You're going to vacuum the car tomorrow. I'm going to vacuum the car. There's nothing I can do. It's summertime in the bush felt. This is what happens. <laughs> it's unbelievable. <laughs> and now apparently this shot will be amazing. He's going to, we're going to cross back to Scott's car and you'll see these things attacking us. <laughs> Viam, are you enjoying this or is this, is, this, is this horrible for you? No, I just don't even want to bite them. They don't bite, Viam, they're I termites. You have not been bitten by a termite before, you've absolute nonsense. <laughs> this is fantastic. Ah, they're tickling me on my leg. They're tickling me on my nose. Oh, look. <laughs> I think I'm enjoying this experience much more than Viam is. <laughs> All right, let's go back across to Scott. He'll give you his impressions. How absolutely brilliant is this. It is by far the most magical scene that I have witnessed on Safari Live, hands down. Like hundreds of little angels fluttering about James and Viem as they approached. And it's those moments and experiences that I was talking about earlier, these kinds of things we are not get, gonna get to relive with other people unless they were here now, like you. So, how awesome is that? Hello. That was ridiculous. That's unbelievable. Yeah. Viam's distinctly less impressed by it than I am. <laughs> they're going to bite me. <laughs> Viam, you've been bitten by a termite before? Yes. No, you haven't. Oh, I don't You're know. Right, In your dreams. Hmm? Your life. Oh, my life. You don't want more. More termites. No, I couldn't you. see you at all. Oh, that's all right. Still can't really see you. Oh, I'm sorry it's about tricky. that. It's tricky. Yeah, yeah. Let me help. Let me help. I can help. There we go. There we are. <laughs> Too bright. No. Viam, smile. There we go. Very nice. They're nice termites <laughs> attracting them to us. Isn't that nice, Viam? <laughs> Do you not like, enjoy the feeling of them tickling your inner thigh? No, that's <laughs> nice. I think it's quite nice. It's a yeah. it's a better sensation than. Uh, that of flies. Yeah, absolutely, that of flies. So, Better than a centipede falling down your back. Yes. Yes. Exactly. All right, well, we'll do one more lap this way, and uh, I suppose we'll okay. do a lap the other way, and we'll meet back at the...
Democratic Republic of the Congo. Very good. Sounds good. Everyone, we're going to send you across Hunter James's vehicle. Come with me, everybody. Toodle do. Have fun. Bye bye. Come with the ants. Bye bye. Well, the termites. There we go. Graham, why didn't you want to VR the termites? I was thinking about it. Hmm. Do you think you can VR the termites? I suppose you can. Shall we try? Uh, we'll need light. Need, well, here we go. I'll give you some light. Oh, the other side. Okay. All right, fine. Graham is definitely much less enthusiastic about the termites than I am. Oh, I've lost my comms again. I think I move around too much in the seat. I'm back, Nicola. I've got a stick here to beat off the termites. <laughs> here is a termite, everyone. Would you like to see the termite, Liam? Yes. There we go. And you say I mustn't think about going anywhere, and... Um, I'm not going anywhere. I don't really have anywhere to go, so fear not. Take those pincers. I know. They're not pincers. They are feet. It does have mouth parts, I suppose. <laughs> Look, it doesn't bite. See? That's not strictly true, actually. I think it may have just bitten me. Now, I know this has been quite fun and funny, but this is, these are the royals, of course, males and females, and they will disappear off into the ground. Hopefully they'll find a consort that isn't related, and they'll make another mound for themselves so that one day they too may have children that fly up into the air and inundate the pants and shirts of humans in the world. Right, well, that's it from us this evening. Thank you, VM, for your efforts today. Big thank you to Nikki and Louise in the final control. I'm going to hand you back to Scott on this soporific and slightly sad evening. And Brian and I will see you tomorrow at 05.30. Bye-bye. Very happy that you and James managed to find the source of VM's worst nightmare, the vicious flying ant, incorrect terminology, reproductive termite, I always make that mistake, but that is what they are kind of known as by a lot of South Africans. So guys, thank you again for a wonderful safari, it's been great fun having you here with us, well done to Brian for documenting the action, as well as Nikki and the girls in final control room for all their help. We will see you all on the Sunset Safari. Who knows what is going to happen? I'm hoping there's going to be fun-filled action. We'll see you all then. Bye.